I have a question for y'all. Is an artist responsible for how others interpret their work? Let's up the ante a bit. Is an artist responsible if how others interpret their work changes the world for the worse? Let's talk about one of the most important buildings of the 20th century that y'all may not be too familiar with, the Barcelona Pavilion. Architectural Outcast. Welcome to the Architectural Outcast, that little old channel from Texas. I want to address something right off the bat. It has become trendy these days for some people to insist that any time you talk about the Barcelona Pavilion, you must give Lily Reich credit for her contributions to the design. For those not familiar with Lily Reich, she was a fabric designer, clothing designer, and later interior designer who had a long time personal and professional relationship with Mies van der Rohe. When Mies ran the Bauhaus, she worked as his personal assistant, running the day-to-day -day administrative details. She also operated as his gatekeeper. You wanted to deal with Mies, you had to get through her first. While they were never married, they lived together for many years. As close as they were for as long as they were, it would make sense to assume that she had some sort of input into the design of the Barcelona Pavilion. But as far as evidence goes, we don't know one way or the other. Unfortunately, Lily passed away in the late 40s, right after the war. Years later, when Mies became famous, people started to become curious about his early days, he wasn't talking about Lily. We just don't know what influence, if any, she had on the design of the Barcelona Pavilion. If it's your head canon that Lily Reich was up to her eyeballs in the design of the Barcelona Pavilion, go for it. Knock yourself out. I have no opinion on the subject, but I will say this. Anytime you start to assume that just because a woman was in the room, she had to have been responsible for the design, you're starting to walk down the street called Misandry. Before you all go hanging your hats on Lily Reich, it might behoove you to look into exactly who Lily Reich was, who she was hanging with, and who she was representing internationally, say, between 1935 and 1942. Her defenders will quickly point out, oh yeah, but in 1942, she was sent to a slave labor camp. When they came for me, nobody spoke up because nobody was left. Y'all might ask the question, why are those in some quarters so anxious to rehabilitate Lily Reich? What's good for the goose is good for the gander. If we're going to look at Lily Reich's associations, it's only fair that we also look at Mies van der Rohe's associations after 1932. One example is the man who brought Mies into the United States and introduced him to the American art and architectural world, and through his control of the American Institute of Architects, made sure that Mies's work was promoted and published, and Mies himself received all the awards and accolades he could have ever dreamed. One Philip Johnson. The Philip Johnson, who is a massive fan of a particular German with a funny mustache. The same Philip Johnson who was a card-carrying member of the National Socialist Party. And the same Philip Johnson who never recanted his affiliation with the National Socialist Party until the day he died. Ask me what I think of Philip Johnson. I dare you. Enough about that. On to the pavilion itself. To understand the significance of the Barcelona Pavilion, we first have to look at what came before why the Barcelona Pavilion was so revolutionary. Humans figured out a very long time ago how to build a home. You go around the world, at first glance, buildings look different. But if you take into account climate, local building materials, cultural aesthetics, cultural needs, strip all that away, and you'll be surprised to realize how consistent the technology is. Fun fact. The most common room size you will find in a traditional house all over the world is 8 foot by 8 foot. That's the furthest distance an unsupported wood beam can span. You want to go bigger? You have to introduce bracing, trusses, some other system. 
introducing complexity. Traditionally, if you wanted to build a house, all you needed were a couple of good buddies and a few days. Things didn't change that much when you moved out to the urban scale in a traditional city. You're still using the same technology. You might be working on a larger scale, but still, trusses, bracing, other techniques work just fine. What happens if you want to show your neighbors who's who and what's what? Build big. I mean really big. Well, that's when you run into three fundamental problems. Mass, weight, and gravity. And gravity is always going to win. All the early monumental architecture, pyramids, ziggurats, mounds, they all had the same fundamental problem. They were cool to look at and climb on, but you couldn't go inside them because they were all filled up with the stuff holding them together. You were lucky if you could carve out a few chambers. This is all fine and good if you just have a few elites going in and out of these buildings, but what if you want to let in the unwashed masses? Well, human beings are nothing else if not inventive. And they came up with another solution, most commonly seen in Greek temples, the column. You're starting to get quite a bit of open space, but it's long, narrow corridors. You still have a fundamental problem. The majority of the space underneath the roof is filled up with stuff, the structure holding up the roof. And the problem is particularly bad around the edge, the perimeter, which affects how much light gets into the interior. If you really wanted to impress the neighbors, show them who's who and what's what, you went with a large open space. And to do that, you pulled out the dome. But the dome just magnified the problems of the Greek temple. You've pushed all the structure out to the edges. The dome wants to flatten out, become a plate. How you prevent that? You create a thick, heavy band, a barrel, around the base of the dome. And if you want to put that dome up high, then you have to have all the structure to support the weight of the dome and the band. You can carve into that structure alcoves, doors, windows, but it's very limited. Again, you're struggling with putting light into that space. The dome's problems are best illustrated by Andrea Palladio's Villa Rotunda. The dome is supported by four massive piers that carry the weight down into the foundation. The rest of the building acts as structural support, holding the piers in place. Exterior walls equal structure. Bigger, higher you want to build, thicker exterior walls. Larger open spaces inside the building, thicker exterior walls. That means limited doors and windows, limited light into the building. There are ways around this, ways to thin out the walls, put in large windows, allow in all that wonderful, glorious light into the interior of your building. Gothic cathedrals come to mind. But then you have to introduce flying buttresses, which creates their own problems. And you always come back to the same fundamental three problems. Mass, weight, and gravity. And gravity is always going to win. And then in the 19th century, some wise guy came along and said, Hey, you know those steel beams they've been using in bridges here lately? You know what? I bet you they'd work really well in buildings as well. Steel frame construction was invented. For the first time in history, you no longer needed weight and mass if you wanted to defy gravity. The steel beam is amazingly light and small for the amount of strength it offers. Exterior structural walls could become incredibly thin, open even, allowing for lots and lots of large windows, letting in all that glorious, wonderful, natural light. Architecture is a very conservative profession. It doesn't like change, especially when it comes to construction techniques. Daniel Burnham, the father of modern-day skyscrapers, was pushing the boundaries of steel frame construction, going ever higher. 
But if you look at his masterpiece, the Flatiron Building in New York City, you will see that the structure is very traditional. The steel structure has been buried within the walls. Walls are still seen as part of the structure. Enclosures are still seen as part of the structure. And then the world changed. Mies van der Rohe was a German architect and furniture designer who was an early proponent of the international style, modernism to you and me. He was also the third director of the Bauhaus, a socialist-slash-communist architecture and art school. Mies was asked by the Weimar government to design a pavilion for the German section of the International Expo in Barcelona, Spain in 1929. Architects love, love, love them some pavilions. It allows them to mess around with concepts and form while ignoring function. I'm willing to bet you all $1,000, and I'm not a betting man, that if you go to architecture school, your very first design project will be a pavilion of some sort. Hell, I've given my students a pavilion as their very first design project. Mies was no different. He jumped at the opportunity to design a pavilion that was only going to be used for a few hours on one day when the king and queen of Spain officially opened the German section of the expo. It only stood for a few weeks and then was torn down, faded into legend, remembered for what it accomplished, but the only documentation were a few partial drawings and a couple of grainy photographs. In the late 70s and early 80s, there was some archaeology done on the site, giving insights into the foundation and then a complete set of drawings were discovered. By 1986, a full-size replica was built on the original site. The pictures I'm going to show you are from that replica. An important thing to keep in mind, the replica is a best guess. It's an educated best guess, but it's a best guess nonetheless. We don't know how far it differs from the original. Enough with the background already. This is the floor plan of the Barcelona Pavilion. If you all don't know how to read architectural drawings, don't worry, I'll walk you through it. The important part are the lines on the right. That's the actual pavilion. On the left is a courtyard surrounding a reflecting pool. The upper left, that's bathrooms and offices. For today's discussion, we're going to ignore the courtyard and the bathrooms. They were tacked on at the end. They violate the rules and language of the pavilion. Let's go on a journey through the pavilion, as if it's 1929 and we get to meet the king and queen of Spain. The red arrow on the floor plan on the upper left shows you where you are and what direction you are looking in each photograph. You enter the pavilion by climbing a set of stairs that are off axis. You're taken directly into the large courtyard where you encounter the reflecting pool. You turn 180 degrees, head under the overhang, through the glass doors, into the space where you would find the king and queen standing in front of the red onyx wall. After meeting the king and queen of Spain, you had several options. If you went to the left of the red onyx wall, it would take you out of the pavilion and onto a path that led to the German section of the expo. If you continued past the King and Queen of Spain, you would see behind a glass wall a small enclosed reflecting pool, and in that pool would be the one nod to traditional art, a neoclassical statue. When you came out of the little space with the reflecting pool, you would go behind the red onyx wall where you would discover the exit out of the building. Before you completely left the pavilion, if you turn to your left, back towards the large courtyard, you would find another partially enclosed alcove. This was a place for more dignitaries to hang out and greet the public. The genius of the Barcelona Pavilion is that there are only four elements to the design. And when you break it down, there's actually only two elements. The first element was a nod to tradition. The site was steep and uneven. So Mies looked back at history for a solution, a raised platform that would provide a flat surface for his building, a plinth. 
The second element is the structure. Eight I-beams. That's it. That's all you get. The third element is the roof floating over the structure. Conceptually, the two are separate and independent elements, having nothing to do with each other. The fourth element, the enclosure, can be further broken down into two subcomponents. The part of the enclosure made up of travertine and green marble and red onyx, and the part of the enclosure made of translucent and clear glass and steel. Just like the structure and the roof, conceptually, the structure and the enclosure are separate and independent elements of the pavilion. Because the enclosure has nothing to do with the structure, it only needs to be strong enough to support itself. It can be opaque, translucent, clear, thick and chunky, light and ethereal, whatever your heart desires. Something else to pay attention to? The Barcelona Pavilion, outside of the single neoclassical statue, has no traditional decorative elements. The pavilion's only decorations are the rich and luxurious materials that make up the components of the building and light. Light coming through the transparent and translucent glass and light bouncing off the water in the reflecting pools. The Barcelona Pavilion was a prototype, a testbed of ideas that Mies continued to develop and perfect for the rest of his career. Some 40 years later, and you see these ideas reach maturity in the new National Gallery in Berlin. Plinth, structure, floating roof, enclosure. All four elements conceptually separate and independent from each other. But now, these four elements are being handled with a lot more self-confidence, sophistication, and complexity. As Mies said himself, God is in the details. The Farnsworth House reveals that Mies wasn't dealing with four elements in his designs. He was only dealing with two. You remove the plinth and the floor becomes another floating plane, just like the ceiling. You can conceptualize the building as a cube. The roof and floor are part of the enclosure, no different than the size. Any distinction is purely arbitrary. In addition to being separate and independent from the structure, the enclosure is separate and independent from itself. There's no doubt that Mies was a genius. He came up with a whole new way to think about architecture, how to think about constructing buildings, and the relationship between structure and enclosure. Woohoo! What could go wrong, right? I can think of two problems off the top of my head. One involves the profession of architecture, and the other one involves all of today's built environment. You all see and have to deal with both problems on a daily basis. The first problem is postmodernism. If the structure is independent of the enclosure, then you can make a building look like any monstrosity you can dream up. But Randy, I like postmodernism. Okay, honest people can have sincere disagreements. It's just a matter of taste. I have taste and you don't. Just kidding. Unless you think making a building look like a giant picnic biscuit is a good idea. Then I ain't kidding. All joking aside, in the hands of a master like Frank Gehry, anything can become interesting, aesthetically pleasing, beautiful. But the masters aren't who I'm worried about. I'm more worried about the person who doesn't give a rat's ass about what Louis Kahn said. Architecture is where the mind is given freedom to play. I'm concerned about the person who's only interested in cutting corners, coming in low bid, making a fast buck. I'm concerned about the person who doesn't care how their buildings affect the end user. Every time you drive down the street in America, Europe, China, Korea, Japan, most of the world for that matter, you're interacting with a world of Mises creation. Strip malls, big box stores, they couldn't exist without separating the enclosure from the structure. The unintended consequences of the Barcelona Pavilion is a world full of ugly, boring, cheap, and disposable buildings. 
Instead of allowing the human mind the freedom to play, these buildings are a blight on our consciousness. We come back to the question I asked at the beginning of this video. Mies kicked over a whole barrel of monkeys of unintended consequences, but is he responsible for how architects, builders, and contractors interpreted his art? I have an answer, but I ain't telling. Leastways not yet. You're all going to have to come back. But now you have an opportunity to tell me what you all think. Is Mies responsible for this mess? Tell me down below in the comments. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, you all be safe. If you're still here, I really appreciate it. While you're at it, why don't you like this video? Subscribe to the channel. Click that notification bell. And you can hear me yammer on about something else next time. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.